Okay, uh, it is 7.01, so we're going to go ahead and get started with this webinar. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ecology, Conservation, and Forest Management at the Andrews Community Forest Webinar. I'm Catherine. I um, I'm an AmeriCorps member at Vermont Land Trust, and I am kind of on the behind the scenes of all the webinars that we've been putting on. Um, and I am just going to welcome everyone and kind of be tech support in the background tonight. Um, so we have about 50 people tuning in tonight um, from all over the place. Um, so that's really cool. We're excited that you're here. Um, I'm assuming most people have had at least a couple Zooms already. Uh, in the past several months, but if you need a reminder, um, you can find the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, type questions or comments. There's also a Q&A um, button that you can use for a really organized way to answer questions so that our um, panelists tonight can uh, see them really easily and you can know if they're going to answer them or not. So those are two tools that you want to keep in mind while you're watching the webinar. Um, tonight, we have Alaire Diamond, who's an ecologist with Vermont Land Trust, and Ethan Tapper, who is a Chittenden County forester. So we're very happy to have them presenting on this topic. And um, yeah, they'll do a Q&A at the end. So maybe be thinking about questions the whole time and then enter them in the Q&A uh, box when you when you have them. Um, and I think that's all the housekeeping stuff. So if, unless I forgot anything, you two can take it away. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm really excited to be here with all of you um, tonight to have this conversation with Ethan and hopefully with, with you as well. Um, I wanted, you know, when Ethan and I started talking about this webinar, thinking about ecology, forestry, and conservation, we just got to have a conversation and it made me think, what if we brought that conversation to the Zoom webinar format? Um, can we just have a conversation with each other about what we are, um, oh, excuse me, my daughter just got home. You gotta go. Hi, go. Sorry, my, my daughter just got back from her, her soccer practice. Um, we wanted to have a conversation together about how I, as an ecologist, how Ethan, as a forester, both approach the same piece of land, what we see, what we look for, what we've learned, um, how that changes the decisions or how that impacts the decisions that we each might make about the land, um, and how we can just continue to learn um, from the land, but also from each other um, as, as people who spend a lot of time on land in Vermont and also on this particular piece. And so we are going to attempt to do that here. Um, one thing that we are, Ethan and I are both working um, as part of a, a coalition, a statewide coalition called Land Ethics Vermont, where we're just exploring the concept of a land ethic, um, the, the ethical approach to land um, that we as humans can take to land as well. So as we're having this conversation tonight, we are hoping that it's a, a way to demonstrate just how we as two people um, can, can build a land ethic together and how that can go out to um, to the broader community as well. So before we jump into it, um, I do, do want to acknowledge that this land, um, the Andrews Community Forest, which is in Richmond, as well as um, essentially the entire state of Vermont, are um, indigenous land that was unceded um, to, at, so it's, it's unceded indigenous territory of the um, Abenaki people. So as we, we started speaking here, we, we thought what it would be fun to talk about what our first experience was at the Andrews Town Forest, um, just to describe it a little bit, to describe where we, um, how we approached this, this land from the, the beginning of our own experiences with it um, and what we learned about it. So I will start and then I'll pass the, um, the screen over to Ethan and then we'll, we'll just kind of go from there. Um, so, I first visited the Andrews Town Forest in January 2017, um, when Vermont Land Trust was starting to, um, had, well, had, had been already involved for a couple of years um, in conversations about conservation and a potential um, town forest um, acquisition. 
And when I visited on that day in January, as you can see in this photo, it was really cold. Um, one of those just brilliant um, crystalline kind of winter days. And one of the first things that I noticed is as we hiked up from the parking lot right along Route 2, um, there were a, a series of ridges. And then in between the ridges, there were some more concave kind of um, kind of hill, hill slope areas. Um, and I noticed really on those ridges, there was the sun was really intense. Um, the snow was a lot less deep. Um, you can see in the photo that there's, you can even see some of the sticks and some of the ground um, there. Um, and I noticed a real difference in the species, the way the forest felt as I was walking on the ridges versus walking on the other hill slopes. Um, species of trees were also really different. Um, on, and, and I should say that as in my role as an ecologist with the land trust, I was really looking for places that might be ecologically sensitive um, on the property. Um, so when I got onto the property, I was really focused on coming, kind of going up on those ridges. I knew that there might be some interesting species of trees and other plants um, on them. And I found that to be true when I got up there, I, I started to see um, a bunch of species that I don't always see um, everywhere in this part of the state. Um, there, you can see here, just really rocky, um, exposed, very little soil, if any at all. Um, this is a basswood tree with a lot of sapsucker holes um, in it. And even through the snow, I could see some leaves of white oak, um, which is something that as somebody who lives in this part of the state, um, right, near, uh, right near Richmond, um, I don't see a lot of white oak. So this is a, a species that I just always find to be really interesting and unusual when I find it um, in this particular area. And as you can see, it was a really sunny, intense day. I was on a south-facing slope, um, very little soil and on, on those, those ridges. And thinking about these places as being places that are relatively warm, um, relatively dry um, for this region of Vermont. And that kind of made sense to me as, as thinking about why I might see white oaks there. Um, seeing this photo, there's also some reindeer lichen, some winter green. And I kept on moving up slope. Um, there were some other slopes that were really covered with hemlock, um, a lot more dense in terms of the, the canopy cover. Um, even in the winter, there's, there's less snow there, because the, not because the sun is hitting it, but because the, the boughs of those hemlock trees are actually kind of catching a lot of the snow before it hits the ground. Um, and I saw a lot of sign of wildlife. Um, this picture here is one that I took. The, the snowy picture is one I took. The other one is, is one that I found on the internet. But this is a deer bed. Um, that I just thought was a, a really cool example. You know, you um, deer will use, will bed down either to rest or to sleep in the snow. Um, and they will, their, the heat of their bodies will actually melt some of that snow. And that's what's happened here. Um, you can see in the bottom kind of right corner, there's these two, um, two areas where you can see it, almost the, the front like elbows of the deer um, where it sat and rested for a long enough period of time that those those kind of indentations melted some of that snow and when the deer got up and walked away they froze into ice and the hoof prints in the middle of the photo were also like where the, the deer's feet had been when it was resting um, so those those feet um, had melted some of the snow around it too and I, I found this picture of a, a sleeping deer captured on a wildlife camera that actually is a really similar position I think to what the deer in this bed was doing um, Ethan you're more familiar with deer um, deer bedding habits than me. Do you think that that's, that's correct, that it would have been in roughly that position? I think that's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so deer um, definitely use this, this area a lot. There were deer tracks and deer trails, deer beds all throughout the Andrews Forest. Um, and we kept on uh, moving, moving up slope. I was with my colleague, Bob Heiser, from the, the Land Trust, who was organizing this entire project. Um, and we came up to some places that I had identified on my um, looking at on the maps that I had that had been using um, before I got to the site and found that there were some places that might look like there were small pools or small wetlands um, and that that had some potential to be a vernal pool in the spring. Um, we got up to one of these and it was it was definitely sort of a frozen over little pool. Um, Mark that in my in my mind and in, in my um, my notes to come back in the spring to see if we could find amphibian breeding um, evidence there. And in fact, we did. This is that same pool in April. Um, and we, that my colleague and I, who were up there at that point, found just hundreds and hundreds of um, wood frog and spotted salamander eggs in this pool. So it's a really high quality vernal pool. It's um, 
it's in a kind of a ledge defined little crevice um, on both sides of it. Excuse me, one moment. Okay, you got to On both sides of it, there, there are exposed bits of bedrock, um, hemlock trees that are shading it, lots of branches um, and wood in the pool that are creating um, habitat and places for the amphibian eggs to actually attach to. And the middle of the pool actually got quite deep. So this is a really high quality amphibian breeding habitat um, that was surrounded by forest in the immediate area, but beyond there, there were some places where there had been some recent cutting to, to where more light was coming in um, to that area. And as we continued going, heading up slope, just found a lot more wildlife sign and found some really, really great um, bear claw marks on a beech tree um, and some bobcat tracks um, at, the, at the foot of a ledge. So I knew that this area, which is the Anderstown Forest is over 400 acres um, of, for the most part, forested land. There's a few open, um, open meadows at the base of it. Just knew that it was really rich wildlife habitat. It's connected to thousands and thousands of acres of other um, contiguous forest. And on to the north um, and to the south, it's there's some open land and the, the interstate highway and the train tracks and Route 2 and, and the Winooski River and other roads in that river valley, but then there's just um, the Camel Sump State Forest on the south. So huge blocks of forest that animals are just moving through. Um, and it was really fun to be able to see that they were, they were in fact doing that actively when we were out there. Um, another really fun, fun thing I found, it was just perfect conditions for tracking on the day that I visited the, the forest for the first time. Um, found one of these great animal track stories in the snow, I like to say. So right he, this arrow in the kind of the middle of the photo is pointed to the, these tiny little set of um, small mammal tracks, like mouse tracks that are hopping across the snow. Um, and then those abruptly end when a, the sweep of a, a bird of prey, um, its wings came down and grabbed that um, creature out of the snow right here in this kind of um, depression and presumably took it away and took it up into a tree to eat it. So it was really interesting to see all these these little dramas that were unfolding um, that had just unfolded on the on the forest floor. Um, Andrewstown Forest has a like all of Vermont was um, under glacial cover, um, a mile thick or more of of ice in the last ice age, and there are glacial erratics. So huge boulders um, such as this one right here that are is covered with lichen that were dropped from those glaciers at, um, as they retreated. And some interesting species I found, um, again, this is one of the, the, the forest you can see is, is pretty dense, but it's the trees are fairly small. So this is an area that I, I assessed as being kind of a second growth forest. Um, right in the, in the foreground here are a couple of hop hornbeam trees um, that have pretty distinctive bark. These grow on um, more exposed sites so you can see this is on a, a small little rocky ridge within the, the larger forest area. And then at the very, um, the very top of the, the property, the highest elevation is, is a really great example of a pretty unusual natural community in Vermont called the dry oak forest. Um, this is a forest where red oak, white oak, like that, the leaf that I showed earlier, um, really dominate. Um, in southern, more southern parts of the state, you also see chestnut oak, which I didn't find up at the Andrews Forest. In the understory, there are species like witch hazel, um, tons of huckleberry were in here, shadbush, um, mosses, pretty open um, understory. The trees in this, er in this area you can see are just not very tall, um, and they're fairly sparse, and they're fairly like gnarled. I don't know how old they actually were, but it's possible that they're quite old because this is a pretty inaccessible rocky spot. Um, and then throughout the property, there are smaller um, ridges that run north-south that also have other um, little patches of this forest. So I found this dry oak forest in patches, several different patches throughout the woods, um, with the, the largest and sort of most dramatic one being at the, the far kind of northern um, edge of the property. There's witch hazel, which blooms in the fall. Um, it's got these really distinctive yellow flowers with four petal or four, um, four parts. And I'm going to switch over to Ethan. So Ethan, what is your, um, how does that compare with what you first observed? I mean, I think, you know, in that, in that particular, the stuff you were focusing on right there is sort of interesting. I was, I was thinking about how, and people who've heard me speak before know that I'm all about like the process, right? Like I'm see, I see forests as these like 
systems where you know an individual tree is just sort of an organ and in the part of this big moving thing and i'm really focused on like the process you know and like stuff like structure how did this forest get to be this way with these species of trees of this size growing in this way and it was it's always really fun to walk with ecologists like when we were you and you and um and liz and i walked the other day because you're so much more tuned into like the the littler things like the little plants that i would never even notice you know and sort of the minutia and the, and the sensitivity whereas i'm all like this you know mm -hmm. um thinking about everything in this big expansive way it's also you know forests are both of those things so they are these systems that are like huge and in movement and dynamic and they're also comprised of a gajillion little miniature important cool parts which is something that i always really value when i get to walk in the woods with ecologists mm. Yeah, I was thinking about how when we, you know, when I went out first, I was like, I've got to go to those ridges, I've got to look for the vernal pools. Um, and those are all places that I think that probably you as a forester are trying to stay away from, um, mm -hmm. both because you, they're sensitive, but also because even if you could, you know, you, you wouldn't want to harvest those trees like in that last slide. They're kind of yeah. small and gnarled and really hard to get to. And um, I was just skipping over these, the majority of the property is really not like that at all. Like those photos I just showed, those were sort of those little, those highlights, um, those high points, I should say. Yeah, and it's sort of a, a weird thing. I think one of the things that I'm realizing about forestry in general, right, is that it doesn't have to be all the one thing. So for some, you know, old school forest management folks, the idea of having areas that would be off limits to to harvesting would be like crazy and really threatening and threaten their livelihood and sort of this like existential threat to what they do. But for me, uh, you know, that's sort of, this is what forest management can and should be, right? Is that we're both doing stuff and like participating in the process and what I think can be like a really cool sensitive way that respects forest ecology and makes forests more complex and diverse. But we can also do that at the same time where we're like not managing every acre of the forest. And while we're like protecting these sensitive and unusual sites and these interesting uh, weird plant species. Um, and I don't feel like that's a threat to like the forest management industry at all. I think that, that all those things, you know, as we think about forests as these systems, we know that there are many different parts that uh, enrich the habitat that a forest offers and, um, you know, help a forest ability to, to grow trees, right? Which if we want to harvest trees, we need a system that can produce them and stuff mm -hmm. like, you know, the invertebrate communities that these tiny little organisms that are cycling all these nutrients, turning dead wood into soil and uh, making nutrients available for uptake by trees and fungi, which are, you know, enabling resource sharing and greater nutrient uptake. All these like little things are facilitating the big things the big trees and these big expansive processes. Mm -hmm. um, and we need complete healthy forests in order to have healthy trees. And so for me, it's, it's completely in line with the way that I wanna manage forests. Should I go to my, to my version of that? Yeah, like when you first came to Andrews, what, what did you see? What did you look for? So... Okay, so... My first visit to the Andrews Community Forest um, was in 2017. I visited with this really cool guy who works for the Mountain Land Trust, Bob Heiser, um, who's just a cool guy to go on a walk in the woods with. He might be on this call. I'm not sure if he is or not, but um, he is a force for conservation in this region um, and has facilitated the, the acquisition, really, of the Andrews Community Forest by the town of Richmond in 2018 in addition to a bunch of other really cool uh, projects. And so he told me, I had come on as county forester in 2016. He told me about the Andrews Community Forest, um, which was a project, the, the acquisition process had already begun. He'd actually been working on it for a while. And, um, and we walked it together in 2017. And the first thing I noticed, similar to what Alaire was talking about, um, it reminded me of my land. So I own um, 176 acres in Bolton about five miles west of the Andrews Community Forest, same aspect, same elevation, very, very similar. And it's, it's everything is like, to me, everything is like dry and like bony and acidic and south facing and stark. And you get these, 
these communities of plants and trees that are specifically well suited to what we call poor sites. So that means uh, acidic soil, soils with less nutrients. I like to say that they're not poor sites, they're just different um, because they're really good at growing some species of trees, but they're not, you know, they're, they're like, they're plucky, they're unusual, and they're not good at growing trees as, you know, if we want to grow trees as fast as we possibly can, and we only want to grow sugar maple or something. So we've got like red and white oak and beech and red maple and white pine and red pine, um, huckleberry, sweet fern, witch hazel, some of these really cool plants like columbine and pink corydalis, um, which are just like really special plants that you'd only find growing on the, out of the side of a rock. And similar to a layer, there's a, there's a huge difference where you get these, what I call concave slopes. So slopes that are sort of like popped out where soil can't settle and get deep and water can't settle. And so they're just like really dry. And then you get these little sags where organic material and nutrients weathered from that bedrock can settle and you get these these pockets these little seams of our rich site species like sugar maple and basswood um, blue cohosh and and some of our spring ephemerals um, and so that was the first thing where i was like i i'm already connected to a piece of land that reminds me of this so it was like extra special to me and so i walked with bob um, again this is 2017 we walked the western portion of the property um, in 2011 through 2013, that whole Western portion of the property, and if you've been out to Andrews, you probably know this, was harvested very aggressively. I don't think badly, but, but with whole tree mechanized logging equipment and definitely um, created some holes in the canopy, harvested a lot of trees. Um, they were there for a long time. And so here's a picture of that from 2011 of the Andrews Community Forest and just watch this area right here. And this is 2014. So you can see that these areas, so again, 2011, 2014, these areas where there have been patches that have been cut, patches of trees, areas where the density of trees has been lowered, so there's a lot less trees. My, my first visit to Andrews was really dominated by that, and the fact that a lot of Andrews looked like this. So this is actually a picture from the Hinesburg Town Forest, but what it's showing is basically what we call early successional or young forest habitat, which is like great habitat. We know that we don't have enough of it on our landscape. Um, and that we want to create more of it. Um, but that uh, I was like, you know, in this patch of early successional habitat with Bob standing on a stump, and I was like, this is great habitat. And Bob said, he said, you foresters are always talking that you're standing in the middle of a patch cut or something and talking about how this is great habitat, but you're never standing in the middle of like an old hemlock forest and talking about how this is old habitat or how this is great wildlife habitat. And I really took that to heart because, you know, we want, so this is an example of, of what we call alpha diversity versus beta diversity. So alpha diversity just means there's a lot of different species. So in a patch cut like this, there's tons of different species of wildlife that use them. There's all different species of plants, all different species of trees. But what's, what that doesn't capture, if we were to just go clear cut our entire landscape, is what we call beta diversity. So beta diversity is the uniqueness of a site. So we don't just want all sites that have maximum you know, number of species, because if we created young forest everywhere, we'd never get the species that require old forest, um, both the wildlife species and the plant species and the, and the tree species that, that like to live in these old forests. And so we wouldn't have high beta diversity because we wouldn't have a bunch of unique sites, which in and of themselves may not support that many species, but they may be uh, completely unique and so have value in that way. And so I sort of took that to heart um, in thinking about how we, wanna, how we wanted to plan for the Andrews Community Forest. So in 2019, I wrote a forest management plan for the property with the Andrews Community Forest Committee, um, which is a volunteer committee that, that um, manages the, the, town, the community forest um, in Richmond. And so what we did is, and I actually took this idea from the Hinesburg Town Forest, we divided the forest into three different zones. It's called a triad approach. It's, it's similar to what they do out west a lot. And in each of these zones, we have differing management approaches, different rules, um, different uh, types of management that are allowed and different equipment we can use. Um, each zone is about a third of the area. And so it's basically this uh, western zone, which is yellow, is, is a zone in which we can make bigger openings. We can create young forest patches like that um, in that previous picture. This area, zone two, which is in this maroon, is sort of an intermediate use zone. So we can manage it, 
but we're managing it with an ecological approach, only creating small openings in the canopy and trying to just really create structural diversity and, and complexity, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. And then the green is what we call a reserve zone. So recognizing that you know, those are areas that are sensitive and areas that we're just gonna let be old forest. And that is also something as we seek landscape diversity, diversity across our landscape is something that we want. So how do we arrive at that? Just really quickly. So here's the Andrews Community Forest in 2014. Uh, shortly thereafter, I was walking through it. Here's that area that was logged in 2011 through 2013, mapped in pink. Overlaid over that are the natural communities. Here we have some vernal pools here and here, some riparian buffers around streams on the property, uh, some dry oak forest, red pine forest, bare mast stands. Um, that was mapped by Alair and others at, at VLT that are actually protected in the conservation easement for the property. Overlaid over that, we have additional natural communities, some hemlock forest, um, some additional additions to the dry oak forest over here and, and different dry oak variants that were mapped by um, a graduate program, a group from a graduate program, Field Naturalists, Meredith Knott and Grace Glenn and Eric Hagen. Um, and then overlaid over that are some other areas that I that I mapped. This isn't. There were a couple areas that were just sort of inclusions, areas that weren't harvested in that aggressive harvest. So I was like, well, these are unique just because they weren't harvested, and so they're different from all these areas that are around them. Some steep areas, areas with sensitive soils, and so from all of these different things, that's how we arrived at these three zones. Um, so the other thing, the the last thing that I'll say about this is that um, I also knew. You know, in addition to all this, you know, the when I was walking out there with Bob thinking about uh, how cool the individual property was and these opportunities for management, you know, cultivating sort of landscape diversity areas that are managed in all different kinds of ways and not managed actively on a single property. I also knew that this property was part of this huge conservation project. So it's called the Chittenden County Uplands Project. It's a project which started around 1990, conserving about um, 8,000 acres of land in three towns in Bolton, Jericho, and Richmond. Um, and these, these parcels, which are in this dark coloring here, these are all conserved parcels, mostly funded by the Forest Legacy Program from the US Forest Service, but also the Vermont Land Trust and the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. Um, and this also connects, so, this, so here are some really significant blocks of habitat. Andrews Community Forest is right here. And we know that forests function better as blocks, as big chunks of habitat. And so the Andrews Community Forest was even more special because it's a part of this interconnected system, which also connects to the 40,000 acre Mount Mansfield State Forest and the 20,000 acre Camel Sum State Forest um, and the 11,000 acre Jericho Underhill Firing Range up here. That's cool um, to think about some of those, the bobcat and the, the bear and some of those animal, the wildlife signs that I saw those creatures moving through those big blocks of forest. It's neat to see that on the map. Yeah, it's just, it's one of these weird things that I think that I think about often is the fact that, you know, uh, in Vermont, we're 75% forested and 80% of those forests are owned by like individuals and families. And so those forests are producing these like huge public benefits, right? So they're like, providing air and water and carbon sequestration and storage and habitat for pollinators and, and you know, creating in, in aggregate uh, a system that really supports our, our lives and, our, and also our quality of life, making Vermont a beautiful place to live and cool places to recreate and all this other stuff. Um, but the, the responsibility for ensuring that those goods, which are like public, falls onto all these different private landowners. You know, it's like, it's such an interesting thing where, you know, you can own a piece of land, like the town of Richmond owns the Andrews Community Forest, but the wildlife on that land are moving across all these different parcels, you know, and and the, the ecosystem functions are occurring across those property boundaries. You know, those natural processes don't respect those boundaries. And so it's just sort of, it's really, it's a cool exercise to think about yourself as, you know, not just like, this is my land, I'm going to make everything good here, but also be like, this is my land and it's part of this bigger thing. Mm -hmm. I, know, I think that really gets to the part of the idea around the land ethic is just that you're seeing, you know, this, the land that you may be able to make decisions about is part of a much larger, larger area and you're yeah. part of a larger community that, that 
is making decisions that are going to be affecting others, which is great segue to the, the next kind of topic I wanted to kind of talk yeah. about with you. Ethan, Last is, thing I'll say about that, Alaire, is that yeah. there's this yeah. quote that I love. I'm going to paraphrase it. I don't know it off the top of my head, but from um, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is a really cool book um, by Robin Wall Kimmerer, which is essentially about the land ethic and the and how human beings relate to the land and and um, manage it and and interact with it. Um, and she talks about uh, the fact that when we and this is a conversation that we also talk about often when we're talking about land conservation, where we say, okay, so you're a landowner, you have a bundle of rights, and when you conserve a piece of land like the Andrews Community Forest, you like take some of those rights out of that bundle. So you no longer have the right to do certain things like subdivide your property and develop your property. Um, and she says, well, you know, we have this idea about this bundle of rights. These are the things that belong to us from the land, but, but not a bundle of responsibilities, right? Like why should, you know, our only, the only thing, our only relationship be, uh, to the land be what we get from it and not also some responsibility that we have towards it, you know, and, and in that way also towards other people in our communities and other people in the world who are going to enjoy the fruits indirectly, the fruits of the good management work that we do. So it's sort of like moving from like an entitlement mentality to a service mentality, where it's not just about you, it's not just about your land, but you're also, you know, people who are managing their land well and conserving it and keeping it as forested land and protecting our ecosystems, those are also, you know, people who are doing a service to all of us. We, we, those should be heroes, you know? We like, we should thank them. Um, and sort of, I think it's so important to sort of shift the way we think about it in that way. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great quote, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I just thinking about this and it's something I, I've been thinking about a lot lately is just the, the decisions that we are able to make that someone sort of said, you know, Alaire, you can make this decision or Ethan, you can make this decision or any, any of us um, who are making decisions about land and the deep responsibility that comes with that. Um, and I thought it would be really fun to just reflect a little bit on like the actual decisions that we make in our, in our roles, um, sort of our professional roles here and how those have, have interacted with each other. You've already shared that a little bit, Ethan. Um, but yeah, just kind of how do we approach those decisions and what's, what's sort of the, the, the basis of that. Um, I wanna share, I'll share my screen with a few more slides, just a couple maps. So yeah, I mean, in, it just in a very basic level in my role as an ecologist at the Land Trust, um, I, I make decisions about ecologically sensitive pieces of, of the lands that we conserve um, and make decisions about how those lands will be described um, and included in our easements, um, additional potential restrictions that are that will be placed on those particular areas. Um, and then that is something that's part of a permanent easement um, that I, you know, at, at the more I do this work, the more the weight of that is really becoming apparent to me that I'm creating work, I'm making maps, um, writing words and those are part of a document that for the foreseeable future in perpetuity will be part of the story of this land um, in a legal way at least <laughs> and and in a practical way too because it, they do really change how people um, may interact with certain certain parts um, this is the second vernal pool that i found on the andrews community forest so i found two vernal pools that um reach a certain threshold of kind of amphibian use and to do that to, to make that decision, I needed to go back in the spring and count the, the amphibian eggs, the spotted salamander and the wood frog, um, for the most part, are the two species that we really find eggs in those pools, um, take a, a series of other um, measurements of it, its size, the depth of the water, um, some, some information about the forest that surrounded it, and then put it through a ranking system that is, is from the state um, natural heritage program. And then with that, these little places that are really just, um, you know, just very small, you know, like a, a tenth of an acre or twentieth of an acre in some some ways, they um, have a, a very, there's a high level of protection for rural pools. And they, the pool itself um, is, and, and the 100 feet um, surrounding it um, as a buffer on all sides is kind of a, a no touch um, area in the easement. And so 
all future landowners, there's just, you know, an existing trail or road can continue to be used, um, but no, no timber um, harvesting, um, no cutting, no new trails um, are really allowed in that area. And that's a big, um, that's a big deal. You know, these are small like salamanders and frogs that thinking about the, the choices that we're making to protect them and their habitat, they still spend their, the spotted salamanders, there's fascinating research that shows that they spend their entire lives um, within average about five, 600 feet of the pool where they were hatched. And then they, they'll go back to that pool to lay their own, to mate and, um, and lay their own eggs. And so protecting those, the, the area right around the pool is really critical. So that first 100 feet um, and the pool itself are a no touch area. And then that additional um, 500 feet outward from the, the 100 feet, so 600 feet total are that second 500 feet are a, what we call a light touch, um, ecological protection zone. So those are those areas that on your map, Ethan, were kind of like a, a circle. Um, and those can be managed in a in an ecological way, I think is, is the way that you might phrase it, right? Would you say ecological forestry would be the, the approach you'd take in those internal pool zones? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's a, uh... So, you know, I think of ecological forestry as just sort of managing forests as they manage themselves. So we would like think about uh, the features that are helpful and not harmful to those to those systems and, and manage them that way. So we know that like yeah. dead wood on the ground is actually really good that spotted salamanders will use will live in, you know, rotten dead logs and stuff like that. So that's OK. But, you know, a two inch rut, which to us may seem like no big deal to a spotted salamander might be like an insurmountable obstacle. And so mm -hmm. stuff that we're doing is also like, you know, uh, if we are doing any management, not in that 100 foot zone, but in that 500 foot zone, doing it in the wintertime um, to protect yeah. to protect those soils and leaving lots of dead wood on the ground and stuff like that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And just just as a visual here, um, once I, I do my ecological assessment of, of a property, so on Andrews, um, it was really looking at those dry oak forests and the vernal pools and the streams. Um, that Ethan, thank you for sharing kind of how you use that data. It was really interesting to see. Um, I created this map on the left, which is a natural features map, just showing those those uncommon natural communities that I found. Um, then was um, supplemented with the great work from the field naturalist students who were able to spend more time um, and identify a couple more areas of dry oak forest and some other communities. Um, and then from my land trust side of things. I created this map on the right, which is the recommendations um, for ecological protections that are, would go into the easement. Um, and th that circle that I was just describing with the vernal pool is, are these kind of circles with the white um, pattern inside. And they, they cover about, about 25 acres. Um, so from one little tiny vernal pool, which might be the size of um, you know, your yard, like a small you know, um, suburban yard or urban yard, um, there's a, tw a 25 acre kind of shadow um, in the woods around that. And that's that's something that's permanently written into the easement and, and protected in a certain way. Um, and, you know, I, I think about that and think about the responsibility of making those decisions. Like, is this pool state significant or not? Are there this many salamander egg masses here or are there this many? And th those things can, can make the difference of whether or not it, it gets that, um, that kind of treatment in the easement. Um, and I think, Let's see. So this is the easement map that was created. It's really hard to see it on here, but it was created from those maps that I made. So this is the permanent easement map that is filed with the, the town office. It's a permanent part of this the Andrews Town Forests um, file, um, legal file. And so it has zones that are, again, hard to see on here um, that came directly from that ecological assessment work that, that I did. Um, and I should say that the other pieces of the the other kind of sensitive areas that I was talking about, those dry oak forests with the white oak and the red oak, um, those are also treated separately in the easement as a dry oak ecological protection zone. Um, so some of these, these spots here with the kind of the, the red and the, the fuchsia and the light green um, are treated in the easement here. Um, and so this is just a very kind of dry legal document, but this is a piece of our easement um, for the town forest. And this ecological protection zone lays out sort of what's important about those natural communities and this describes what can be done there. And so in these cases, um, in these forests, we want to allow for forest management that is done in a way that takes into account the ecological 
um, the sensitivity of these places. So I think just like you were saying, Ethan, like from your perspective, you kind of look at them as, or in the in the forestry, silvicultural language, it's like they're poor sites. Um, I think of them as ecologically sensitive sites that just, they, they don't have a lot of soil, they very droughty. Um, if you were to try to do get up in there with any kind of equipment, you know, the soil would erode and, and you'd be down to bedrock pretty quickly. Um, so we, in our easement, say that not specific um, things that can or can't be done there, but just that if there is management, it, it needs to be done in kind of a sensitive way. And I, I was curious, you know, from your perspective, like, would you ever want to do any kind of management in these places? Um, I mean, I, I can think of two different things. So one, the only thing that's allowed, like in a dry, in those pockets of dry oak forest is invasive species management, right? Because yeah. that, that's management that's sort of, I, I say the the minimum responsi responsible amount of management is no management plus invasive plant management because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, invasive plants can completely derail those natural processes that make dry oak forests and other stuff so cool. The only other thing that I could think of that I'm always like, I wonder if we can do this someday and the systems don't exist yet is burning. Um, yeah. Which, you know, so we know that some of these dry oak forests have species that are fire adapted like red pine, huckleberry, blueberry, um, and that probably uh, low intensity fires were like part of their natural processes. Um, yeah. And if we could find a way to do that, that would be something I'd be open to. But we, we were joking when we were standing up on that dry oak forest. I was like, oh boy, I can't wait to log this, which is a joke, right? Because this is an area that's easy to protect because the trees are like little and whizzled. The areas that are harder to protect are areas that are also growing like really valuable trees. And we just are choosing in those areas to, uh, to value them, their ecological features over their, you know, sort of commercial value. Mm -hmm. which is you know we live in a world that's like in many ways governed by those economics and so that could be a hard argument to make for some people yeah it's interesting when you're talking about fire it just made me think of some reading i i was doing about red oak and white oak um which are there there's there are two different groups of oak trees so there's multiple different species of red oaks and then multiple species of white oaks and we have i don't know how many species of oaks in vermont i don't know eight or ten or something like that and the throughout the whole state and these um these two white oak and red oak are maybe the, the most common red oak for sure i would say is the most common um but they are really distinct from each other they diverge genetically like 40 million years um white the group white oaks from both they just they're they're quite different even though you often see them kind of grown in similar places um and one thing that that I had read about white oaks and fire is that they are pretty tolerant of fire, but their leaves are also pretty nutrient rich. And so in places where there isn't a lot of fire and they're dropping their leaves, they are almost some, there are some theories um, because white oaks have declined in New England over the last few hundred years. So my, some theories that with less fire, um, the conditions for growing white oak are just less common. So it's, it's an interesting kind of compliment to that. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, what do you think? Let me stop sharing my screen here and put it back to you about sort of the responsibility. You've talked a little bit about it, but is there anything else you, you want to share with folks about just the choices that you're making about the land and how you approach those? Yeah, well, let me do my um, share, share my thing here and then we can sort of discuss how we, how we differently approached the answer to that question. So what decisions about the land are you responsible for? How do you approach those decisions? So, um, you know, county foresters in Vermont, it's a job that's really weird and really cool. And basically what our job is, is to help those private landowners, the owners of private land. Annette's on this call, that's her right there. Um, uh, landowners of private land manage their land re responsibly. And so again, even though the 80% of our land is owned by private landowners, there's a tremendous amount of these resources which are sort of held in the public trust. And so there's a tremendous public benefit to those private lands being managed well. Um, and so what we do is we help um, private landowners learn to manage their land. There's also a, a tax abatement program called the Current Use Program that um, incentivizes good forest management that we administer. Um, we go out and take walks with people talk about what's going on in their forest, um, opportunities for management if they're interested in that. 
and we help municipalities manage their land, which is something I've really uh, dived into with the Andrews Community Forest in Richmond. Um, and what I'm really excited about, this is on the Hinesburg Town Forest, which is a really cool 864 acre town forest in Hinesburg. Um, I've gotten really excited about using town forests to demonstrate what responsible forest management looks like. So again, I talked about, I'm really like a process person. So I see, I see yes, the individual species that occupy a forest, but I really see them as these systems which are in movement. And one of the really cool things about, about being a forester, Eric Sorensen, who's an amazing ecologist, one time told me we were out walking and he was like, what do you think you would do here? What do you think you would do here? Um, and I was like, yeah, I might try this, try that. And he was like, you foresters are amazing. You see stuff and then you do stuff about it. And there's a lot of opportunities in Vermont, not just to like, you know, I think about not just harvesting trees in a way that's not harmful, but harvesting trees, cutting trees, and sort of creating these disturbances, driving these disturbances in a way that's actually regenerative. We have a tremendous opportunity to do that on our landscape because our landscape is so altered from uh, historic land use from the 1800s and subsequent poor forest management, stuff like that. So there's a lot of opportunities to make our forests more complex. And so I really love to showcase that on these town forests. This is me out on the Hinesburg Town Forest with some UVM students. Um, part of this is talking about doing forestry in a different way. So, you know, I practice ecological forestry, which I used to think just every forester practiced and I learned I was wrong. Uh, at least they, they don't practice it explicitly in most cases. Um, ecological forestry is just what I call managing forests like they manage themselves. So instead of thinking about how to efficiently turn these trees into wood, we think about and how to grow, you know, the next generation of trees that we can then turn into wood. We're thinking about how do forests work? You know, what are the dynamics that govern them? What are the processes? You know, what, it, what do forests look like when they, when they manage themselves? Um, and sort of a, a subset of ecological forestry, uh, what's also called new forestry or disturbance-based forestry, ecological silviculture, ecological forest management, um, is work that's really come out of UVM. Um, so Bill Keaton and Tony D'Amato have thought about specifically and explicitly managing our Vermont's relatively young forests to be more like old growth forests and recognizing that old growth forests are these incredibly diverse um, places that support this incredible richness of life and that there are things that we can do to, to make, we can't make old growth forests sooner than they can make themselves, but we can make our forests old growthier, we would say. We can make them more like old growth forests. Yeah. Um, um, can I just jump in yeah. I, to interrupt you because um, Justin Greenland is asking us a couple of questions, which I think are great mm -hmm. um, about, you know, I think, do you have plans here at Andrews to use silviculture to actually accelerate development of old forest conditions um, by increasing structure, adding snags and down wood? Um, and then just kind of as a compliment, you know, similar um, question, just what are the top management priorities here? And so I'd love to have you just talk about the old, your, you know, how do you actually do that? With the old growth and then the management yeah. priorities and i think just because we are um we only have 10 minutes left tonight oh, yeah. um if you i i'd love to hear you share a little bit more about the oak you're thinking about oaks and and the future of the forest with regard to that and what you're what you're doing um sure. actively yeah so um you know specifically what old growth forests in vermont are like is that they are they have big trees some big trees but also pockets of trees of all different sizes and ages, dead standing trees, dead wood on the ground. Um, they're defined by their diversity and not their uniformity. Um, and so what we can do is that to, to make forests more like old growth forests is we can, number one, make them more structurally diverse. So that just means encouraging different sizes and ages of trees. So our forests are pretty young and they're usually dominated by one or two ages of trees, but to make it more. Um, we can leave big trees. So traditionally when trees got big, we cut them and we can not, we can cut them sometimes, but not do that, specifically leave legacy trees. We can leave tons of dead wood on the ground. It's not a waste, it looks messy, but it's really, really important and good for the forest. Um, and we can protect these sensitive sites. Um, and so in doing that, so I sort of think about, you know, sort of in contrast to, to the approach where I'm thinking about how can I individually create habitat for each individual animal, plant, tree species, I'm thinking about how to create 
diverse and, and processes across the landscape that are also representative and in proportion to what we know these historical processes are. So like we knew that we had a certain amount of young early successional forest on our landscape prior to European settlement 300 years ago. Um, and we have less now. We know that, you know, probably 55, 60, upwards of 60% of our forests were older than 150 years old, you know, in this sort of what, what we might call an old growth condition. And now we have less than half a percent. Um, and so, so what I think about rather than, you know, the, on, so on the Andrews Community Forest, we are talking, we are thinking about individual species in some respect in the way we're thinking about those vernal pools. Um, you know, we are protecting deer yard, even though we want probably want less deer, but we want good habitat for the deer we have. But, but really, I'm just thinking about creating a bunch of different types of habitat in proportion and, and capturing all of those different species that way. Um, and the one that Alaire mentioned is oak. So I'm, I'm really into oak. And this is also because I have simil a very similar situation to what is the situation on the Andrews Community Forest on my land. And the situation is that um, there's, there's a bunch of different reasons for this, but basically we are struggling to get regeneration of oak, which is a really important species on this type of site, red oak specifically. Um, there is white oak, which we also want to encourage, um, but red oak should be more abundant than it is in the understory. It's not because of deer brows, too many deer on our landscape, which we increasingly know we have in some places. And the Andrews Community Forest is a south facing slope, so deer congregate there in the wintertime. And they really like to browse oak, and they don't like to browse American beech, which is a, a, another species that does really well on this type of site. Um, American beech, which we know was prior to European settlement, like 60% of all the trees on this type of site were likely to have been American beech. Now it has this invasive disease called beech bark disease, which stresses it out. And when beech trees are stressed out, they shoot up all these root sprouts. And so the combination of deer browsing the oak and not browsing the beech and the beech being stressed out, so producing all these stems in the understory can pretty much make it so you have this monoculture beech. So, and, and we don't have fire on our landscape, which we know would be something that would probably kill young beech and not kill uh, young oak in the same way. So what we're doing, you know, is basically we're using logging as a tool to regenerate red oak specifically. And we're gonna get a lot of beech and we're gonna get some oak, but to get some oak, we need to really try really hard to regenerate oak. Um, and so what that means is uh, burying acorns, so skidding trees over acorns. And right now it's a, it's a red oak seed year. So there's a lot of acorns on the ground. And so as we cut trees and we pull the trees over those acorns that are on the ground, it buries them and it increases their chance of germinating and not getting eaten by animals by about 50%. Um, and uh, we are leaving the tops of trees and the branches of trees uncut up. So leaving these like big, messy, horrible looking brush piles that are hopefully gonna protect those young oak seedlings when they sprout um, and creating some, some bigger openings, not big, big openings, but bigger openings like half an acre where oak is gonna be more competitive than beech, which really likes to grow in the shade. Hmm. So let me just, I'll just stop sharing this over there and then we can just sort of talk. Yeah. Um, thank you, no, this is great. And I, I got another question um, from Gail who's asking is active management necessary if the aim is for old growth like or old for development into old growth conditions? And I would say, from my perspective, the answer is no, active management is not necessary. Um, given, given time, um, the forest will develop into old growth forest. I think what, what you're really describing, Ethan, is if, if you want to, some people really love to be in the woods and do things and to maybe try to um, speed up the process a little bit. And I think that if, your, what you're sharing is that if that is someone's interest, there are strategies to kind of try to help create some of those conditions, but definitely it's not necessary. Yeah, it's and I mean, it's, it's, it's not even just interest too. For me, it's thinking about this, this type of forest, forests that were like this, old growth forests that were like the dominant, the major type of forest on our landscape just 300 years ago, which is like an evolutionary time is just the blink of an eye. It's less than the blink of an eye. It's a fraction of a blink of an eye. And, and now to know that that goes from, you know, 60% of our landscape to 0.5% of our landscape, I really think I'm thinking about, yes, both keeping forests to become old growth forests and be unmanaged, but then also wanting to provide those conditions now and thinking about the context of like, you know, 
climate change and the fact that we're losing biodiversity really quickly and stuff like that. So, so for me, I'm like, yes, let's let forests become old growth forests. But I think that there's a lot of value to making forests more like old growth forests now, because we know that those features that we can create um, are also have value in and of themselves. And we can create them so that they happen sooner than they will naturally. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, I, I love this photo um, that I just took at Andrews a couple of weeks ago when we were out there. And it's just, you know, showing these this snag um, standing, standing dead wood that is just riddled with woodpecker holes and it's just providing such great habitat and food um, for, for so many species in there, not just the woodpeckers, they're the most obvious. Um, but seeing the complexity of the structure um, there, some, some different sized trees, some trees on the ground, some trees standing that are dead. Um, and then in the background of that young forest, and as I was looking at this earlier, I saw one of the trees had been marked, right? Is that a, yeah. That's a tree that'll be cut yeah, in the harvest. Mark, yeah. yeah. So it's like, it's just really interesting to think about kind of, yeah, like what's in the foreground here is maybe what you're, we're trying to create. Um, and you can speed that up by doing. Totally. Yeah. Doing and, it, and, and, yeah. you know, one of the interesting things is that like, so uh, some people would say that the pileated woodpecker is a keystone species. So a keystone species, a species that creates habitat for a bunch of other species. And they are that way because they lower pest populations, you know, wood boring pests. Uh, in the forest, they they speed up nutrient cycling, so help wood break down more quickly. Um, you know, we know that they have like in the in light of emerald ash borer, they have a significant impact on emerald ash borer populations, slowing down those infestations. And if we were to go in there and remove every diseased or dead tree from the woods, we would be eliminating the the habitat for that species, which is um, you know creating so much habitat. And and you know bringing along all these other species and and f facilitating these really important processes. And the other thing that I would say, and just the way that I think about forests again, like uh, it's it's really easy to think about as I'm looking at this species and I'm seeing this like really cool snag and I'm seeing this tree that's marked to see this this you know death in the forest as being this really scary thing. For me, as someone who uh, I think that I think of the the natural processes, mortality, disturbances, um, as being the things that make forests more diverse and complex, and you know have more interesting wildlife habitat. To me, and I think to the forest, you know, the death of a tree can be like a celebration. You know, it can be an opportunity for something really cool to happen. You know, and a really a really cool fact that I bring out sometimes to illustrate that is that there is more biomass, about four times more biomass in a dead tree than a living tree. And the reason for that is because these dead trees are these, we might call them like keystone structures. They're supporting the life of all this other stuff, which is also valuable, that is not able to utilize a living tree. And in the same way, you know, when a tree falls in the woods, the, the response, the ability of the forest to fill that space with new regeneration, new different species of plants and animals, um, is just such a profound and important thing. And so it's sort of, for me, it's like thinking about forest as systems changes the way that I, I interact with like them on an individual tree basis, where I think that the, the, the killing of trees in this way uh, can be really cool. And it's not for everyone. It doesn't have to be all of one thing. It doesn't have to be everywhere. I think that's also a really important message for this kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, that's great. Um, we are, so we are at eight o'clock, um, 8.01 actually. I want to just note that there's a couple of questions that we are, um, we're not going to have time, I think, to fully answer tonight, but I want to, um, Catherine, I would love to be able to have, um, keep these questions and not have them disappear when the webinar is over so we can follow up with people. Um, you know, I, I, I just, I think I'll just name them and, and just kind of say that they, they're excellent and they're things that are, there's no easy answer and they're being discussed um, by folks in the ecological and forestry community. Um, Gail's asking if active management isn't necessary, why does the state encourage management through current use? And I think I would answer that just really briefly by saying that there are some really rich discussions happening um, at the state level um, and with, with ecologists, with foresters and, and um, about that program and sort of is there a place for this kind of old growth management in current use? And there's no, there's no um, answer to that yet, but it's something that's being actively discussed. Um, next week, Liz Thompson will be 
giving a webinar through VLT on old growth forests. And so she may, um, you'll be able to learn more about that particular type of community from her and, if you want and to just join in that. like a 15 second answer to that too. I would say that another really beautiful thing that we didn't get to talk about is, um, you know, which is a whole nother reason for, you know, sometimes cutting trees is like local renewable resources, which we know are uh, forces which, you know, have feedbacks, which actually protect our ecosystems and um, diminish our impacts on more vulnerable communities. They're a force against environmental injustice and environmental racism. Um, and so, and, you know, while it may be challenging, you know, incentivizing using local renewable resources like wood, which is extracted from a living system, um, can be pretty amazing. Um, and so that's something that I, that I definitely believe in and I definitely talk about. So it's not just you know, if we don't, if we need forest management, if we don't need forest management to make old growth, it's also, you know, are there, are there other reasons why we want to manage our land actively, um, which have other feedbacks that are positive? Yes. Yes. Um, Trevian's asking if we suffer from too many deer and a general imbalance in the ecosystem, do, do our land ethics require we ask questions about reintroducing predators? Um, yes. My answer to that is that's definitely I've reintroduced myself as a predator into that ecosystem for that reason. <laughs> there you go. And well, I think I think yeah. that that's that's like in the short term. I think that the answer is yes. And I think in the short term, you know, thinking about, you know, how how are we the predator of that animal, um, in that context is really important. Yeah, yeah. Um, Annie, oh, Annie helped with the timber cruise. Great. Um, <laughs> yes, I remember. Um, yeah, what management in the face of climate change? Um, you know, I would say one interesting thing that I I had thought about with this is just the, you know, white oak um, is a species that doesn't. This is kind of far north for white oak to grow. Um, it grows at Andrews because it's it has these really warm, dry spots. Um, and I see in the future in a, a scenario where the climate is is warmer um, and you know not necessarily drier, but definitely warmer. Um, white oaks might be a bigger part of the landscape. They might be in other places besides just those isolated on those little ridges. And so I think thinking about management for oaks is one way to think about, um, is one way to kind of have climate change be part of those, those plans. Um, that this is a group of trees that will be with us and they'll probably be a bigger part of our forests in the future, in a warmer future. Um, so managing for them is, is a way to have that, that structure start to start to be um, get promoted. Yeah, it's sort of like it's it goes back to like the species versus the process. Whereas what I'm thinking is like, you know, you do need to encourage like individual species that are more adapted to future conditions. And then I'm like, but we should make like resilient forests, you know, forests which are more diverse, forests which are more complex, which we know will make them more resilient and adaptive. So I'm thinking about it from like, again, from like the big blown up big picture. Um, and if you if you do want to, I'm doing a presentation on that on Thursday, um, and you can email me to find okay. out about that. That's great. Um, yeah, and unfortunately, we are a, a couple minutes over time, so we're not going to have time to get to everyone else's question. But I I am um, I think that we'll be able to see them um, through this webinar, and when we will we'll have this webinar posted on our our YouTube channel, and I uh, Ethan and I will look at the questions and and we'll follow up with folks. Um, you can also reach out to us at alera at vlt.org um, and ethan.tapper at vermont.gov. Um, I would love to end um, with just a photo. When I think about the future of this forest um, in 100 years, I have really had fun finding historic photos of this area. And this is Richmond just down the road from the Andrews Forest, what's now the Andrews Forest in 1911, so over 100 years ago. And I just want to take a moment um, tonight uh, before we leave to just look at these non-forested hillsides. You know, they're open, there's just tiny patches of woods here and there, but you can see the ridge line is just totally smooth because of these, these open fields. And that's what our forest, that's what our landscape looked like in 1911. Um, now it's much more forested. And I think what I would love to see um, and what we are, I think, Ethan, I think we're both um, kind of really working toward this in, in very specific and, and active ways is that forest not just being there in 100 years, but being more complex, um, more diverse, and in all of the ways that we've, we've talked about today. And in some ways that, in some cases, that means letting it be. In other places, it's 
um, involves really doing some active work um, to kind of repair some of the harm from that historic situation. And this is just one spot that we visited where um, it's a, it's hard to see it in this photo, but it's a stream um, that probably wasn't wasn't there 100 150 years ago it was created by erosion from previously open land so i think this work that we're doing um is you know we're looking toward the future and i think that that's something that you and i both share um that you're looking toward a future that you're never going to see and it's humbling um and thinking about the decisions every day but it's also really exciting and um yeah i guess i i'd love to just end there and if you have any just further um further thoughts we hope the conversations will continue um and yeah any final final thoughts on your end I, yeah i would just say that you know looking at that old picture and um you know sort of the the scars on the land the you know all we're all we're trying to do like my future vision is um forging a relationship for you know between us and between the land and our ecosystems which is you know functional in which it keeps us happy and healthy and have healthy communities and get to do fun stuff like, you know, go for a walk or a ride in the woods um, and allows our ecosystems and their inhabitants to also be happy and healthy. Um, I think that that is, that's my, my future, my future vision. And I don't think it's unobtainable. I think it's, I think it's right there for us to get. That's great. Thank you. Well, I know people have been kind of dropping off and thank you for those of you who've stayed um, for sticking around for another few minutes. Really appreciate everyone who's come tonight. Um, and thank you so much, Ethan, for having this conversation and um, all, for all the work that you've really been doing um, at the Andrews Forest and making sure that people are really have so many chances to be engaged with it. I think it's just, just great. Um, again, please feel free to reach out to either of us and we will kind of go back and forth and try to try to answer questions um, over email that we didn't get to tonight. So thanks so much again. And um, see a um, you'll see a survey from VLT in the next couple of days. And we've got a couple other great events coming up. And that's it. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Have thanks, Alaire. Thank you.